we all share a common curiosity about the night sky. You can even trace this curiosity back to the earliest days of recorded human history, where we found cave paintings that depict the constellations. These same stars have continued to tell us stories across cultures and generations, and they still do today, where you can find a public planetarium in almost every major city. This same night sky inspired my own fascination with space growing up, where some of my favourite memories were spent just laying on a trampoline in my backyard, staring up at all the stars and filling my head with questions about what's out there. How did this seemingly endless blank of twinkling stars come to be? But what's out there behind the stars? What about behind that? What about even further? Just how far away can we actually look? Well, back then, laying in my backyard, I had no idea how you would even begin to answer these questions. But countless people have been pondering the exact same things for hundreds, even thousands of years. Centuries of both individuals and international collaborations, all working towards understanding the universe around us. And we've come so incredibly far in figuring out ways to answer these questions. We can now build telescopes that are so powerful, they're almost like time machines. Light takes time to travel through the universe and reach us here on Earth. And so the further away we look in space, the further we peer back in time. And we are constantly developing new technology that allows us to look further than ever before. So what if I told you we're just now reaching the point where we can peer so far back in time, we can almost reach the beginning of time itself, the birth of our universe. Driven by our relentless curiosity as human beings, we will go to the literal end of the world to discover the beginning of our universe. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute, but it makes for a pretty interesting story how some of this got started. And like all interesting stories should, it begins with two scientists and some pigeon poop. So back in 1964, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson were hard at work at Bell Labs in New Jersey, trying to find the origin of this mysterious source of interference in the radio antenna they were operating. And after ruling out a few potential candidates, they even went to the trouble of removing some pigeons that had set up home in the antenna. And in the words of true scientists, they removed the white dielectric material that these pigeons had left behind. But still, the interference was there. Well, we now know that they were in fact seeing a signal from the cosmic microwave background, an afterglow of light from just after the Big Bang. They were both awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics a decade later for uncovering this keystone piece of evidence in the Big Bang Theory of our universe. Now, this cosmic microwave background, you can think of it kind of like the universe's baby photo. It's a snapshot of the conditions in the early universe when it was only a youthful 370,000 years old. Now, that might sound like a long time for us here on Earth, but for a universe that's now over 14 billion years old, well, putting that in terms of our own lifetimes, it's like only being a few hours old. But this snapshot of the universe is just that. It's light from just a single moment in its history. We'd love to directly observe what was happening before that, even earlier than a couple hundred thousand years. But the universe before this moment is like a thick, impenetrable fog. We just can't see through it. Nevertheless, even though we can't take more of these snapshots further back in time, we can still build an amazingly accurate timeline of our universe just by taking our cosmic microwave background baby photo, feeding in our standard laws of physics, and just turning the clock backwards. Kind of like how you could predict what a newborn baby looked like based on a photo at three months old. But luckily in our case, the laws of physics are far more well behaved than babies. Now, some of you might be starting to wonder, exactly how far back can we go? How far back in time do we really understand what the universe was like? Our laws of physics hold up just fine when we turn the clock back to a year after the Big Bang, a month, even the first second. But it's earlier than this, earlier than the first nanoseconds, that things get incredibly interesting. The density and the temperature of the universe is so insanely large that 
our standard laws of physics struggle to describe the processes that are happening. And there's even the question of what made the Big Bang. Go bang! Well, we currently believe that it is during this period, this first fraction of a second, the universe underwent a phase of rapid expansion, blowing up to billions and billions and billions of times its original size in a process known as cosmic inflation. Not unlike the current expansion of the universe, but far more violent and all taking place in the blink of an eye. And if you want to get really specific, about this many blinks of an eye. Now, even though we can't observe this event directly, it should have left a special signature imprinted in that light of the cosmic microwave background. And this signature is finally within reach. Our detector technology has radically evolved since we first discovered this light all those years ago. But even still, measuring this signal is far from easy. First off, this light has been travelling for 13 billion years to reach us here on Earth. And on this journey, it's been bending and scattering through all that matter between us and the beginning of the universe. So if you want to detect the signal, it means we better make sure we do a really good job of understanding all the other stuff in the universe as well then. We also have to worry about the possibility that the signature from inflation is weaker than we predict. Or maybe it's not even there at all. But this doesn't stop us, because both of those scenarios would still provide us with valuable information on the universe's earliest moments. Now, aside from the technology that we need in being able to detect this signature, there's another vitally important ingredient, and it is teamwork on a larger scale than ever before. We're in an era where so many of the unanswered questions about our universe just can't be tackled alone by individuals or even individual countries. It needs to be a global effort. All of us sharing our unique expertise, our knowledge, and in reality, the costs of our ever improving technology. All working together towards a common goal. With this combination of technology and teamwork, we can push our sensitivity to the levels that we need and luckily right now, there's a relatively straightforward way we can achieve this. More telescopes. Now, ideally we like to put telescopes up in space, where we can get above a lot of that pesky atmosphere that interferes with our observations. But unfortunately, a lot of the time, it's just too expensive. And with the exception of the Hubble Space Telescope, they're also not designed to be upgraded, meaning that once they're up there, the technology we are using is fixed. So, having a telescope on the ground, that is, here on Earth, this allows us to continuously upgrade its capabilities every several years, which allows us to stay on the cutting edge of detector technology. But, just because a telescope is on the ground, doesn't make it any easier to get to. It just so happens that the best locations on Earth for observing microwaves from outer space is in the middle of two remote, harsh deserts. The Atacama Desert in Chile and the South Pole, Antarctica. Two places where teamwork is essential, not only to achieve our science goals, but even just to stay alive. There are currently three microwave telescopes living at the South Pole. We have BICEP-3, the brand new BICEP array, and also the creatively named South Pole Telescope which is the one that I spent a lot of my time working on during my time as a PhD student here. So, when I left my home in sunny, warm Western Australia, and I made my way here to Toronto for grad school, I did expect that I'd have to adapt a little to the colder weather. Well, I might have taken that a little too far. Somehow, I found myself a long way from home on this featureless white plateau that stretches as far as the eye can see. It's a place so cold that any exposed skin is at risk of frostbite within minutes, and so remote that it takes several days just to get there. While you're at the South Pole, you can enjoy a weekly ration of four minutes of shower time. Although most people do like splitting this up into 
two showers, so you can really enjoy this luxury twice a week. And with internet access limited to only a few hours each day as a lonely satellite passes overhead, well, it's easy to feel like you're at the end of the world. So then, why would you even want to put a telescope all the way at the South Pole? And it's pretty simple really. There's no pigeons. And actually for that matter, other than the humans, there is nothing else alive there at all. We are the only creatures that are stubborn enough to put up with conditions that are inhospitable for any kind of life, all in the name of science. But no, it's not because of the pigeons. There are actually three very good reasons to make the South Pole an ideal place for a microwave telescope. But all three of these do take a major toll on the human body. The first of these reasons hit me when I got off the plane at the South Pole for the very first time. All my heavy cold weather gear on, thick boots, bags in hand, and as you can imagine, it's, it's hard work trudging across all that ice and snow. And so you start to pant a bit, take these huge deep breaths, but getting nothing. Those lungfuls of air just don't contain the oxygen that your body needs. And that's because the South Pole Station actually sits three kilometers above sea level on top of a gigantic ice plateau that covers the entire continent. It's so high up that travelling there straight from sea level actually puts you in the high risk zone for what's called acute mountain sickness, a life-threatening condition that can and does result in medical evacuations. Your body does acclimatise after a couple of weeks, but it's vital that you don't push yourself too hard. So the altitude is not ideal for humans, but being so high up puts us above a lot of that pesky atmosphere which interferes with our observations. Now the second thing that makes the South Pole so ideal has to do with water. More specifically, the lack of it. Water does a fantastic job of absorbing microwaves. And most places on Earth you can find lots of water just floating around in the atmosphere. So if we want to actually observe microwaves coming from outer space, we want the air to be as dry as possible. Well, the South Pole definitely checks that box because all that water that you'd usually find floating around in the atmosphere is frozen right beneath your feet. In fact, the air is so incredibly dry that your body is constantly building up an electrostatic charge just from moving around. It's the kind of thing that gives you that really nasty zap if you touch something. And if you do manage to zap and damage some sensitive electronics, well, you're going to be waiting a really long time for a replacement all the way at the end of the world. Some people that spend time at the South Pole even develop this funny habit of just tapping their hand against metal objects while walking around the station just to discharge that static buildup. And finally, we have the third reason for putting a telescope all the way at the South Pole, the sun. Now, I'll never forget one of the very first late nights I spent at the telescope, working away on the camera in a windowless room until sometime around 2 a.m. Finally get to the point where we're ready to call it a night and so you get rugged up to walk back to the station, open the door to walk outside and BAM! The bright sun in your face really removes any feeling that is actually 2 in the morning. And that's because at the South Pole there is only one sunrise and one sunset every year. During the summer months the sun constantly spirals overhead, treating you to never-ending daylight. Slowly the sun will start to make its way down below the horizon, plunging the station into darkness for those long winter months. This constant daylight or constant darkness is enough to mess with even the best sleep schedules, but once again, ideal for the telescopes, because the atmosphere stays incredibly stable when it's not warming and cooling with the sun every 24 hours. So for reasons you'd want to be at the South Pole, we're now at three for the telescopes, a big fat zero for the humans. But despite this harsh continent pulling out all the stops to be as inhospitable as possible, it results in something incredibly special. A community of people that showcases our ability to work together. Living and working in Antarctica presents countless unique challenges. We overcome each one by being able to rely on each other and come together as a team. 
There are 70 permanent research stations spread across Antarctica, operated by 29 countries with representations from every single continent. In a world with seemingly endless conflict and disagreement, we have at least all managed to agree across the globe that Antarctica is to be preserved and used only for scientific purposes. On top of this, the research stations and field camps are populated by people from all sorts of different backgrounds and walks of life. There's scientists, there's cooks, cleaners, firefighters, countless professions, but all people that have travelled to one of the most remote and harsh locations on Earth to support and further our understanding of the world around us. So, coming from an Australian, studying in Canada, on the United States Telescope, located in Antarctica, science truly is borderless. To me, there is no better example than Antarctica of our ability to work together internationally, uniting together as a single team. And using this very same teamwork, we'll soon be able to unlock those remaining mysteries surrounding the very first moments of our universe's life from the beginning of our universe to the end of the world.